Okay, introduction to Jewish beliefs, class one. Now this class, I'm sure many of you have heard, is called the Mashiach class. Okay, the reason it's called that is because a chunk of the semester is going to be about Mashiach. Okay, who, where, what, and most importantly, why. However, that's only part of the semester. What this course is really going to do, and by the way, you'll get philosophy credit for this class as well, right? You're welcome. <laughs> Believe me, you're going to you're love me just for that. Um, we're going to go through all of history, looking at philosophical and theological ideas. This is not a halacha class. You're going to get nothing halacha from this class whatsoever uh, if you want to learn Jewish law. It's okay. You're welcome. Um, we are going to discuss a number of topics, although we'll do a little bit about kosher at some point, as we'll see. But we're going to start at the beginning, and we're going to end at the end, which means this course, let's just talk introduction first of all, is going to span a maximum of, as we'll see, it could be less, God willing, it could be less, but a maximum of 6,000 years, as we understand them. That is going to be the key number. We're going to start at the beginning, and we're going to, God willing, get right to the end of that 6,000 years, picking on the main parts as we get there. So we're really taking a, a global view, and we're going to jump in at various junctures to figure out what's going on, okay? So in order to begin at the beginning, we have to begin with the first ever person and his wife. And their names were Adam and Eve. Adam and Chava. Okay? So let's begin with body and soul. Page two. Let's start with the Pasuk and Bereshis. Vayitzer Hashem Elohim es Adam. God formed mankind. Elohim. When you see that word, that name of God, again, I don't know the levels. We have different levels over here. We have people who grew up with pretty good Jewish education, I'm sure, and some of them, like myself, who didn't grow up with such great Jewish educations, but got one later on, maybe. Elohim is one of the names of Hashem. What kind of name is it? What is the name Elohim? As soon as you name Elohim, something should jump out at you. What is that something? Judgment. Right, gosh, very good. Yeah. Very good. Remember, very good. That's Hashem's name of judgment of din. Okay? So Elohim is going to be din, judgment, the strict name of God, if you will, as opposed to God's name of mercy, which is Yud with a He with a Hashem, is referred to as, or Ado with a Noi. Okay, that's Hashem's name of mercy. All right. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu used that to form the Yitzhar as Hadam, man, Afar Min Hadama, dust from the earth. All right, there's a physical aspect to mankind. This is not male, so this is mankind, okay, male and female. The Yipach Ba'apav, God blew into the nostrils of man, of Adam, who came from the Adama. There is no coincidence over there. Nishmat Chaim, a soul of Chaim, life. Vahi Adam, this breath went into his nostrils. And by the way, that's why we Jews will categorize life by breath. Okay? There's a big debate happening right now in the world, which is still being had, in terms of at what point is person alive? Is, is brain dead still alive? Right? Is heart death alive? I mean, at what point are you really dead? That's going to be very important when it comes to organ donation and the like, which is a big discussion happening. Uh, but generally speaking, we use breath as the determinant of life. It comes from this. Nishmat Chaim Vayadam, it came mankind. Lenefesh Chaya. What happened over there? What just happened, my friends? Sorry to make you think so early in the semester. A little cruel. We saw a change. What was the change we just saw? We saw a nishmat chayim, a soul of life, that became a nefesh chaya. What's a nefesh? <coughs> What's a neshama? It's not a trick question. What's a neshama? So why does it change the word there? Neshama, nefesh. Is there a difference? Anybody? I'd like to hazard a guess. If you don't know the answer to this question, you're in the right place. You stay, so maybe if you know the answer. Yes? 
Well, the physical we already have. The physical was from the Adama. Adam came from Adama. The physical creation. And then we're told, you know what? This man thing that we're talking about has a Nishmat Chayim, has a Neshama. But you know what? Not only that, it's a living being and it's also got a Nefesh. Weird. What's like on sale? Like two for the price of one? What's up with that? Okay. We're going to be answering that question, God willing, when we get there. But so far, just from this passage, we see that this thing called mankind is made up of two parts. A physical part, that we're going to see in Chazal referred to as the guf <coughs> and the neshama. Okay? The guf and the neshama. The neshama is going to be our go-to term for the spiritual component of mankind. However, it is going to, as we'll see, remain solely in the domain of humans, as opposed to nefesh, that we are going to share with other creatures and life forms on earth, as we shall see. Yes? So neshama, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get to it and look at a precise uh, answer to that question. For now, we're going to use neshama as a general go-to term for the soul, if you will. However, what I want to show you is that it's a go-to term. There's different parts to it. Actually, five parts to it, as we're going to see. All right. Guf is the body. Thanks for asking. By the way, any Hebrew words that are words that are written on the board, you need to know, write down, and translate. Okay, you're expected to know these words. So I don't know your level of Hebrew and translation, the rest of it, but that's a good start. As we go through the book as well, we're looking at a lot of sources. I'll be stopping along the way and having you uh, look at various expressions along the way. Some expressions we'll be using, as I'm sure you know from your Jewish education, that have a lot of relevance. Okay, let's go to the Ramchal, Ramosh Chaim Lutzato, the Italian Kabbalist and great teacher. He's gonna give us an explanation, a very important one, which is gonna be a very important introduction to our course. Without this, you're not going to figure out what the heck is going on with the rest of the course. It all stems from here. He's going to do a nice summary of all of world history and everything in it. It's very nice thing to do for us. He says, Gezeira Chachma Leona, the highest wisdom decreed, there was a Gezeira from Shemayim, God decided, Shiadam Murkav, that mankind is, um, consists, Mishnei Hafchachim, two different, different, Sides, totally different. Right. There is no relationship. They're stuck together, but they're completely different. Dainu minashama sichlet v'zacha, a neshama that is intellectual and pure. That is the soul. Okay. Uh, the words he uses are very important words. He's not. He isn't just like rambling on. They are sichlet v'zacha, v'guf, but also a body. Artsy, physical, earthly, hardcore, and it's it's unenlightened. It's mixed up. It's impure. Shekola chad mehem, each and every one of these two, yita beteva letzido is going to go leteva. What is teva? Right towards its nature. So he said nothing too wild over here. Based on the Pasuk, we're made up of two sides, a guf, a physical, and a shama, a soul. This guf is physical. This neshama is, as he called it, sikhat, intellectual. You'll see that it's going to be the location of part of the soul in the brain. He also said they are opposite. Hafuk, they're different from each other, very different. And each one of them is going to go towards its nature. There's a natural inclination, natural way they go. Now, this word I want to talk about. So we're going to stop towards the early part of the course to define words. How do we know translations to words in general, by the way? I think I discussed this in the last class. How do we, how do we know what words mean? I, I said the word teva, and you said nature. How do we know it doesn't mean banana? All right. 
or sandal. Oh, it, it does mean sandal. That's heavens. Sorry about that. Do you know what that mean? More that coming, my sister. And as well as being a pharmaceutical company, it means nature. But how do we know this, what it means? How do we know it means nature? So, interestingly enough, we rely upon the rabbis to tell us. But how do they know? Right? I mean, did, you know, did Rashi open his art scroll, see the English, and then figure out uh, the French, in his case, because he lived in Troy in France? And the answer is, no. what Rashi does, and most other commentators do, is find that word elsewhere. When you find the word somewhere else with the same, or with a different translation, but the same letters, the same shoresh, they're connected. This is basic Judaism, but it's very important information. Okay? Which means if I find this word, or this shoresh, elsewhere, with a different meaning, those two meanings must be connected. Okay? Simple Jewish. Everyone understand what I'm saying? So yes, Rabbi? Okay, if you don't, please ask. So we see the word Teva appear elsewhere. Where else do we see the word Teva appear? What does the word Teva also mean as a Shorish? What does the word Teva also mean? Hmm? Who said that? That's a great answer. Very, very good. I would go more with a coin, a matbeya. A matbeya, a round object. Interesting. So we're going to put over here and relate to it. I'll put it in parentheses because it's not really a, a coin, sorry. A coin. What else do we see the word? <laughs> it also means to sink. To sink in. Bua is to, to sink in. Yeah, something is not on the surface. Right? Tevas Noah was sunken in to the water. Why would the word for nature? By the way, if you know me already, which I don't even do, but I'm very into Hebrew. Well, Hebrew words reveal a vast amount to us. We'll see why later on in the course as well. So it's very important. They reveal so much to us. So I'm going to learn, in other words, I can learn something about this by knowing what this and this are doing connected by this showrish. Are you following me? Yeah? You, you ever do this before, this kind of thing? Has anyone heard of this connection before? Great, you're in the right class then. So I have to take a guess. Don't think a little bit. And other teachers that stand out, you do—they just like throw information at you, make you memorize it, and then spit you out. That's not the way it's going to work in this class. That's so not what I'm about. <laughs> yes. I don't know about the thinking, but with the coin, um, I remember reading that like because nature is like a manifestation of God. Nature is a, is a big. That's a big statement you're making there, Mina. Nature is a manifestation of God. Okay, whatever that means. Yeah. So a coin, it's like, it's like an imprinted Very nice. A coin it has its worth by its intrinsic value, but it's also got an imprint on it. It's embossed. Something is etched into it, or actually embossed on it, really, to be uh, to more fair. Like, like so it's an imprint of something else. Someone made a decision and put that imprint, and it has representation based upon what's printed on it, right? A coin becomes worth, good as a quarter, because it's, it's embossed, right, with a seal from the right, United States Treasury. Okay. So a coin is important as a matbeah because nature is the imprint of God in the world. That's what it refers to as nature. Nature is God's imprint, which means you could theoretically, and the Rambam says this, look at nature and see God, right? Because he's imprinted. He's put something about some information that's on that coin that's revealing about the person who pressed the coin. You with me? So to the same about nature as well, there's something about the natural world that is going to represent and to illustrate and to demonstrate and to inform and educate about the creator of the of the imprint. Right? It's like a, a mirror image, it's like a it's an embossing. Good? That makes sense? It's a deep idea, but it's a beautiful one. A lot of deep ideas coming for me. Very deep. <laughs> the next is sink, to sink in. Not a sink, but to sink in. Oh, I thought I came to say brute actually. And what is that? So it goes like this. You could look at the natural world, right, which is God's imprint, and think that's all there is. <coughs> and you have the challenge, unfortunately, of sinking in, thinking, well, this is everything. You could fall for it. Right? You could think the natural world is the only world, and that is the nature of everything, of all existence. But that's not true, because there's a spiritual world as well. The representation of the spiritual and physical world are actually 
manifested in us. We, humans, are made up of body and soul. And the body is the keli, is the vessel, as it's referred to, the kli, that holds within it the soul. During this course, we shall be talking about my daughter's favorite subject. I'm blessed with four daughters. And what do my daughters love? Not school. Oh, no, 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 no. Shoes. <coughs> Happens to be that shoes play a very important part in Jewish thought, life, and even history. But I just throw this idea at you right now. And Chazal say, just as the shoe holds the body, the body holds the soul. The na'al, the shoe, holds the body within it. And by the way, every time you see shoes appear in Jewish life, or the lack of shoes, right, appear in Jewish life, Jewish thought, Jewish history, whether it's Moses taking his shoes off, whether the Kohen taking the shoes off, right, Chalitza, we'll get to all these cases later on. All of these things we discuss reincarnation, which we're discussing in a few weeks in this Hashem. All these things are there to teach us a lesson about the body and the nature of the soul. Just as the shoe holds the body, so too the body holds the neshama inside it. It is the nal, it is the shoe, the vessel, the kli that holds the entire body in it. Okay? I had a bit of a jump over there, I wasn't going to mention that, but it came to my head. The big thing you know right now is there's a tab, there's a nature to the physical world. Just as a nature to the physical world, there is a nature that means a system to the spiritual. And the Ram Chal, if you read his writings, does a lot of this explaining how there is a system in the spiritual. We just think, yeah, it's all spiritual, everyone's like floating around. No, there's, there's a hierarchy. There are certain things that happen, certain things that trigger, certain places, certain things you say, certain things that you do with your body is going to trigger and impact the spiritual as well. The two we're going to see are going hand in hand. They're opposite, but they're together. Which means that we, humans, are walking contradictions as most of you probably feel most of your lives. And just wait till you get married. Okay. okay. We're good together so far. Yes. The coin thing. It's just that another way of understanding it. It's nothing too too crazy. Just it's embossed. A coin is the is what's imprinted on it. That's what makes a coin into a coin. What makes a coin into a into something of value? Well there's an intrinsic value. Right? But the intrinsic value may be less, hopefully it should be less, other people are going to melt it down, because of the imprint that's put on it. Okay, now the imprint is telling us something about the person who, when they find old coins, they get very excited. Right? We learn stuff like King David, you know, every day hear stories like, yeah, coins represent, what they, they are the currency, but they represent the person stamping. So the word nature, the natural world around us, is referred to as teva. Happens to me, it's the same as a coin. Why would that be? Because the spiritual world, is, has an imprint in the physical world, right? which is na nature is like an imprint that's put on this world that we can say, I can look at that imprint, I can figure out something about the imprinter, right? That's the, the, the metaphor, but it's, it's connected by the word. It's got to be connected, it has the same showresh. Yeah, does that make sense a little bit? That ain't too crazy, I'm not gonna be tested on this, but it's just good to know. Yeah? I don't understand what the sinking is. So the sinking, the sinking is that the natural world is such that a person can be lost in it and think that this is all there is. That's really what it is. But it's not. Like, that's, the... that's not absolutely not. That's the that's the trick. That's what you have to got to get. Out. That's what you dig out of. That you're trying to dig out of. Yeah. Okay. So he says Shekolacha mehem yita is leaning betevelitzido towards its side. Dahainu. What does that mean? Haguf lechumriot. Your body wants physicality. Vanishama lasichriot. But your soul. He's defining the soul. Pretty cool thing to do. That's pretty easy to us, right? Because everyone's doing it like online, right? But this is the Jewish version of it. The soul is moving towards intellectualism. Right? It wants the spiritual. Your body wants to stay in bed, and your soul wants to come to Rabbi Hanjab's class to learn something. Right? Your body wants to stay in bed, and your your soul wants to go daven. Right? This is this is this is the the contradiction. This is basic Jewish. Nothing weird or spooky yet. However, we got some bad news. Although these two are in partnership, they went into business together. Actually, we're going to see, according to Chazal, they were forced together by God. Right? As it says in Pirkei Avot, 
Al kochata notzar against your will you are formed. The al kochata nola against your will you are born. The al kochata chay against your will you live. The al kochata met and against your will you die. Right, it's all against our will. Hashem creates this. This is not. We have no free will in this. We are sandwiched in. <laughs> oh, my bad. It all looks well and good, but it's not so good. The Tim's up in here, Milchama. There is a war, a battle, a Milchama. Oh dear, inner battles, not sounding good. Call my therapist. But Ofen, Sheim Tigba, Nuhanishama. However, if the soul wins, the metaphor, the war thing, if the soul wins, but Ofen, Sheim Tigba, Nishama, the Shama, Gavar wins over, Titale, he, the soul goes up. Vitala guf ima. Now this is wild. The body goes up with it. The soul's actions, we'll see what the, what the actions are, we're going to see what they are. But the soul's, the actions of the soul, which is weird because the body's doing the actions. But anyway, if however, the soul wins over this battle, which is going to have to do in partnership because they are partners, and it wins over, it's going to go up, be elevated, whatever that means, and the body's going to be elevated as well. You're going to affect the body. However, there's the opposite. What's the opposite? The also Adam. Oh, sorry, he's going to finish off. However, this person is going to be Mishtalem Bishlemet Hamutad. He's going to be pushed towards completeness and perfection. Okay? His ultimate perfection. One second. The Imyanich Adam. However, if on the opposite, a person allows the body to win, would find what that means as well, but let's just take it on face value. She had Safbar Homer, and the body's going to win over this battle that is happening. The body is going to be detrimentally affected by this. But they're in partnership together. You can't have a business with two partners, with one partner making lots of money, the other person not making lots of money, but also you can't have a partnership and business with one partner losing money and the other not being affected as well. Because they're a partnership. So if the body goes down, ergo, the neshama is going to go down as well. He's just pointing out the two are intrinsically linked, although they are total opposites. You don't get more opposite than the body and the soul. The yota oto adam, and this individual, this person, built out guf Their soul is not going to reach its completion, its purpose, whatever that is, for that particular soul. I mean, it could be different for every soul. The mechanisms could be the same, it could be different. Depends who they are, what they are, where they're from, what's going on with them. But he's talking general terms. I mean, every individual is going to be different, but that's what he's saying right now. Right? And uh, such a person is being divorced, as it were, pushed away from God. He still has the ability, however, to subjugate his physical to his soul and intellect. Just because you've gone down, don't mean you can't get up. That's what you say. Basic Jewish concept. Okay. Nam. Second paragraph. We're on page three. Those who are following, which I hope you are. Gezar Tuvay Sprach. God in his goodness. That's interesting. You would have thought, it doesn't sound so good, does it? This doesn't sound so helpful. Like, it looks like the uh, the odds are stacked against me. We'll see that. In some ways they are, some ways they aren't, actually. But he's made a good point. He's like, God did this for the good. This is good. We need this. Somehow, this inner battle of body and soul that we're going to be struggling with for the rest of our lives, no matter where you are, no matter how old you are, from 3 to 103, 143, I don't care. Everyone's going to struggle with this for their entire lives. We're all part of this battle. If you live, you're dealing with this. I know I am. However, he's saying this is this is good. Is it God's doing this to us for a favor? Right. He says that there's gonna be a limit. This is not an ongoing battle forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's just when you're in this world, when the body and soul together. Okay. But there is a limit to this. That a person is required to expend in order to get this perfection. So he's like, these two are put together, but it's a short-term business. It's not eternal. God is eternal. The soul could be eternal, 
but the partnership between them is not eternal, as we all know, right? It's pretty obvious, right? After a period, the effort is done, it's completed, and that person gains their perfection, and then gets to enjoy it, which is forever. Now, he doesn't at this point tell us who's enjoying it forever. Is it the body? Is it the soul? Or is it both of them? Which do you think? Is it the body, the soul, or both of them? What do you think? Well, that's not, I had a question. Yes. Um, what if the person doesn't get back up? If you said he can always get back up, or if the person doesn't get when back up? When a person is in this world, and the two are together, they have the ability to get up. But what if he doesn't? He doesn't get to enjoy this? Great, great question. Seemingly he doesn't. We will be looking, uh, I do a few classes, as you will see, on reincarnation, which you don't have to believe you don't want to. This you got to believe, this is basic Jewish concepts. This is principles of our faith, everything we're saying so far. There is an opinion among the Kabbalists and others that you may get a second, third, fourth, fifth, thousandth chance, if you want to believe in it. You don't have to, it's not a principle of our faith. It's spoken about, but if you don't, then no matter what, a person may miss out on eternity. We're going to see that Kol Yisrael Yeshan Chalak every Jew has a Chalak Lama The question is how big? How big? So he's not saying you get removed from everything. He's just saying you may not get as much as you should be getting. Right? That's another possibility. We're doing a lot today, right? Your brain's hurt yet? His mind's already turned to guacamole. He's about to ooze out of my ear. But I like guacamole. Okay? So he hasn't told us yet, but it, in theory, what's your name again? Dina. Dina. Dina, according to this, if he gets it right and the soul gets back on track, and that, by the way, as we'll see, the Gemara is going to tell us, that could happen in moments. Rabbi Hiram Nasi actually burst out crying on a few occasions, seeing how quickly you can fix it. A last moment of action, actually, according to the Torah, even as a moment of thought, like the children of Kurach, can fix it. Right. Whilst they're together, it could be a small little action that can fix it, even at, at the end of a person's life. Ideally, by the way, according to Jewish law, even at the end of your life, you want to fix it. Real teshuva repentance, which is what he's kind of referring to over here, to some degree, I guess, <laughs> um, is meant to happen the day before you die. We just don't know when we die, so we do it all the time. Okay, but whatever it is, you're together, you get it done, once it's separated, when you get to enjoy this, it's a short-term battle, and then one person gets eternity. How big their portion of eternity is, he doesn't say. He doesn't say it's the same for everyone. It's not one size fit all. al -Kain. therefore, so here's the next part, okay? So we're moving ahead now. So stay with me, my holy sisters. al -Kain, therefore, you got two sides to yourself, but you also have two times. Two zmanim. Echad zman ha'avoda. One zman is for avoda. What's avoda? Work. The achad zman kibul schar. The other time is for receiving reward. So. God may have created two opposites together, body and soul, guf and neshama, but he also created two sides, two times, okay? One time for work, one time for receiving reward. Now, he's just referring to his time. We're going to see that we're going to have to figure out what this time really refers to. We're going to refer to it as with a general term known as, anyone know? Olam Haba. But that doesn't tell us too much either. We're going to see that even the term Olam Haba, which we're going to spend a lot of time discussing here, can refer to three possible times. I mean, actually, it's referring to one of them, but three possible parts of one time. Yes. Um, the time that you're saying that after they reach perfection, that they enjoy this eternal... Um, like, they enjoy Reward. That means that's a Olam Haba? Yes. He hasn't called it that yet. He's gonna, but that's what you're, that's what you're referring to, yes. And he's turned out, the, he's, at this moment, he's referring to it as Zaman Kibbul Schar, the time of receiving reward. 
I'd write those words down. If you don't know them, kibble will underline them and we'll translate them. The time of kibble schar. Okay? Zman ovoda, zman kibble schar. Vulam, he says. However, mirata tovuruba. The good news is that this is a general rule, however, that which pertains to the good is always more, always greater. Okay? That's a general rule. There could be bad, but there's always more good. So that, you know what? It's a nice rule for life, that. They may be bad, they may be hard work, but that's limited, and then there's good. Shavoda yeshle zaman mochukah. The work has a specific set amount of time. Right? It's limited. Right? That's the way God decreed it suitable for this purpose. Right? For God's purpose, really. The The period of reward, however, has no has no end. This eternal thing we're talking about has no limit. This world has a limit. The work has a limit, and then it just is going to stop. Now, he could be referring to personally stop, <coughs> but he's also referring to nationally stop. Right? There's man we're talking about. In your head, you're probably thinking life and death. But that may not actually, that's probably actually not what he's really talking about. He's talking about the amount of time that we're in this world, which is going to be a maximum of 6,000. It could be less. We'll see why later in the course. Got that. But there's also going to be another world in the future that is eternal and will keep going on and on and on and on. He's also referring to that. Okay. And all of that is asher kanat law. That which a person <coughs> derives from their effort. Sure. Which bit of it? I said a lot. Gone already. Wait till you reach my age. You hit 40, suddenly. <sighs> the world we're talking about, this Zman of Oda, okay, is limited. It's, more, it's got a specific limited role. Now we think of it as what it means life, right? It doesn't only mean our personal life, he means all of mankind as a collective unit has a certain amount of time that we get to get the job done. Then after that, we receive eternal reward. Okay, so it means on an individual basis, as we're going to see, it also means on a national, international, historical basis. Does that make sense? Are you following? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Because I'm losing the plot myself. Yeah, are we together here? Yeah. A person that which they acquire, the kanalo, he, he acquires it. Right, look not, he's acquired it, yeah. So all we said, we're trying to figure out what this man of Avodah, what is he talking about? He says, you know what, the time of Avodah is limited, the time of Tova is eternal, right? Because he said general principle, it's always more good than bad. So we're trying to figure, I'm just trying to figure out, well, what is this, what is this time he talks about, the Avodah time? Is it just when we're alive? So in some degree, yeah, it refers to while we're alive in this world, but he's also referring to not just our personal life of living and doing stuff, it's also returning to mankind's existence is also limited and is going to come to an, I won't say an end, but it's going to come to a changing point, which we're going to see is definitely going to happen. It depends on us when and how. That we're going to see is in our hands. This is all introduction. If you don't understand everything, do not panic. We will be going more and taking other journeys into this. Yeah, did I answer your question though? For a word, yes. Zman avoda, zman kibul schar. We're trying to figure out what that means. Yeah. So the eternal, the eternal is olam haba. It is olam haba. We have to. We don't know what that term means. But I thought you said each person has a different time. No, 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 no. I mean, the world as a whole. Everyone has a different amount of time in this world as an individual, but the world itself has an, a, a limited amount of time. Of where we're going as a world as a 
as a nation, as a whole world. We're going to get there. No, no, no. Limit is in this world. That is a term. Olam Abba is a term. Netzach Netzachim. That is, no, no, that's the amount by which they get to enjoy Olam Abba. But they're all there. It's the quality, not the quantity. Make sense? Is this new information for most of you? You kind of heard bits of this, kind of put it together? Okay. Oh, what time is this? 11.30. Okay. Which means, incredibly, we've reached the end of our class. Right? Yeah, it's 11.45. 11.45? 11.40. Oh. Yeah, I don't know, 11.45. Okay, let's... Let's stop up there anyway, because the next piece is a little investigation. We did a lot today. We learned so much. Wow, thank you, Rabbi. That was, like, amazing. Uh, we're doing a lot more of this during the semester. Have a great day.